Major funding for In Your Neighborhood Vineland has been provided by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, working with others to build a national culture of health, enabling everyone in America to live longer, healthier lives. And PSENG, we make things work for communities. Welcome to the Garden State, where the fertile farmland is sometimes vertical and the bounty isn't just measured in bushels. From farm to table and vine to wine glass, agriculture's in full bloom. We're in your neighborhood, Vineland, exploring it all. Welcome to the Garden State, all of you at home and online. I'm Mary Alice Williams at a produce stand in the center of Jersey's agricultural heartland, a pit stop for produce heading from farm to table. We'll track a bushel over the next hour, and we'll travel with agritourists to some of the wineries that abound around the state. We'll look at how the lack of fresh produce affects families living in food deserts, and we'll show you where alternative farming is looking up vertically. A lot cooking for you, but first, Vineland's mayor has stopped by to kick things off, Anthony Finucci's with Michael Hill. Mary Anthony Finucci, thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, tell me this. How did you pull this off in Vineland? 14% unemployment rate during the Great Recession 10 years ago, now below 6% 10 years later. How is that possible? An awful lot of hard work. Uh, you know, it's a combination of a variety of things. One, a lot of, like I said, a lot of hard work. Uh, a little bit of God's grace and uh, some great marketing. What's coming to town? What kind of businesses? Why is Vineland attractive to them? We have a variety of different businesses coming in. Predominantly, Vineland is known for its food processing, its agriculture and produce, and we have a significant number of those types of businesses coming in and locating. Cold storage, there's been a boom on the cold storage facilities uh, in the most recent couple years, so we see a lot of expansions. Uh, we have glass houses because Vineland was known for its silica sand many years ago. So we've had several expansions there would not only include the facility expansions, but employee expansions. Um, we have been working on a technology initiative in the city of Island, trying to create a smart city concept here. And that has uh, pushed a lot of these small tech companies in to start opening their eyes in Vineland, uh, looking at some things there for us. Um, our marketing has reached out, not just regionally, but nationally, to uh, look at other companies from the industrial perspectives too. We're looking at bringing in companies now from precast concrete plants to, uh, to local businesses. We're seeing engineering firms and attorneys and accountants, a lot of uh, small businesses popping up all over the place. And of course, the medium-sized businesses are starting to grow, and we're really starting to gear towards the large sector as well. And Vion is a tremendous amount of land, a phenomenal industrial park. We own all our own utilities from electric, water, and sewer, so it allows us to be significantly more competitive in the market when we're trying to seek out a company and woo someone to be here. With this kind of attraction, people moving in, what are they saying when they come to Vineland, when they decide we want to set up shop in Vineland? What do they tell you? The interesting thing is we get a lot of wow. We get that wow factor, like, wow, I never knew you were here, or wow, I didn't realize how big of a city this is, or wow, I didn't realize you had all your own resources like this, and wow, you know, we see a business-friendly administration. They don't necessarily get to see that a lot of places, and we're very pro-business here because I come from the small business sector. So it's important to me to see small business growth as you hear a lot of it, it's the backbone of the country. Well, it most certainly is, and it's certainly the backbone of, of our region. Whether you pick your produce at a you pick it place or the produce aisle, or at one of the state's 11, count them 11, county fairs, have you ever wondered how it got there? We decided to track a bushel from farm to table. We assigned Leah Mishkin to make a beeline through the process. Instead, Leah just followed her nose. We buy it from the supermarket. It makes it into our meals. But have you ever wondered how the pepper gets from farm to table? Let me introduce you to Bob Redding. He'll be our tour guide today as we journey through the story of the pepper. You can call Bob the godfather of produce. He's been in the business for over 50 years. Even from the car, he could tell you if the fruits and vegetables in the fields were good quality. There's, that's field corn. That's not fresh corn. Look at that acreage. That's a great thing for us because he also happens to know the best fruit stands in town. And let's be honest, we took this assignment to get some fresh, juicy drip down your arm when you bite in kind of peaches. Bob knew exactly where to stop. 
Miss, do you have any soft ripe peaches, little quarter baskets? I see you have nectarines. And I'm taking them down to George Cassidy's farm. Bob pointed out these goats and sheeps on our drive to Cassidy farm, but it was his mention of cinnamon donuts that caught our attention to do one last detour. Naturally, we stopped at farmer's market number two. Because I eat them faster than she can put them out, so. All right, back to the pepper. It all starts in the greenhouse where the pepper seeds grow from February until April. The greenhouse is full of peppers and you overhead water them in a little sprinkler. From the greenhouse, the peppers get planted until they're ready to be picked in July. It would look like that and you would plant it about like that and it just grows, grows, grows. Cassidy Farm has been in the family since 1895. It was your great, great grandfather's? Yeah, it was only 70 acres. Remember where we showed the squash field? Yeah. There was uh, 70 acres there, that was the original farm. They know I'm the farmer. See, I'm the farmer, I'm their friend. Yes, those are bees. Not photographed me in the car yelling at the fellow passenger to close the window. We digress. All right, this is the big reveal in the Pepper story. Do you want to say that? It's not me. <laughs> it should be a commercial that we have service out here. Oh, yeah. That's my phone. That's Bob's oh, phone. Oh, this is your phone, Bob? Yeah. I muted. I just muted. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Did you know the green pepper and the red pepper are the same thing? Like eating a green pepper is like eating a green tomato. So once it's got all its sugars and stuff like that, it's when it's, it's red or starts to have color, it's mature. So technically you're eating an immature pepper by eating it green. It'll be sweeter. It might have more, I don't know, vitamins and stuff because it's totally, it's mature now. But this will cost me more. That will cost you twice as much. The red pepper costs more because it takes about two weeks longer in the field to get them from green to red. George says you'll lose about half of them in that time to external factors like the weather. See, this is from the sun. It's like you and I being exposed to the sun. It just burns. It got sunburned. Feel how warm that is. Oh, yeah. Wow. So it'll get hot and it'll burn it. Look at that one. Yep. That one just shriveled up. That one got dehydrated. That's a dehydrated, that's a dehydrated one. <laughs> You're too long. You don't pick that. No, that's the plant if that I got broke when they picked it. If I any them. longer, I'm going to look like that. That's right. <laughs> so. It is hot out here. Yeah. yeah, it's rotten. See, that's what happens, and if you look, if you really look super close, see there's white, see the white things on there? Yeah. That's all spores. So when it rains, all those spores will spread to the other ones and rot all the other peppers in the field. So just be careful. See where the plants are dying? It's more, see over there? That's where the spores got on the plant and killed the plant. George says you also won't find these in-between ones in a supermarket because stores only want pure green or red. It's a visual market. It's usually restaurants that will buy them. These are actually cheaper because they're in between. Because they're an in-between color, nobody really wants them. So these machines are here to sort the peppers after they've been picked. It's dividing them out by size among other things. If you're at a chain store, they weigh it by the pounds, or they're going to They want a big one. one. For a little one, they're not going to buy a little one because you have to buy too many. Right. So the peppers are then put into a box, loaded onto a truck, and off they go to the next stop. This bucolic landscape represents a billion dollar business. Farmers here produce more than a hundred different kinds of fruits and vegetables that are marketed both here and in countries all over the world. Nationally, New Jersey is in the top 10 producers of fruits and vegetables from A to Z, that's apples to zucchini, grown on 9,071 farms, covering 715,057 acres of productive farmland. The big money, grows in nurseries, greenhouses, and sod, followed by fruits and vegetables, field crops, poultry, and eggs and dairy, all certified Jersey Fresh. And the person overseeing it all is New Jersey Secretary of Agriculture, Douglas Fisher. He's with Chief Political Correspondent, Michael Aaron. Mr. Secretary, thanks for being with us. Uh, how healthy is the agricultural sector in New Jersey these days? First of all, it's nice to be with you, Michael. I've known you for a long, long time. Uh, agriculture is healthy and, and doing just fine in our state. It's always changing. Uh, we're always growing different uh, commodities and some the same. 
what I'm getting at is that in certain areas, uh, we are in the top 10 production in the entire country. What are we big in? So we're big in blueberries. Uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the top 10 producers uh, in, the, in the country. We're uh, in the top, uh, last year we were number two in peaches for the entire country. People think it's Georgia, it was actually New Jersey. Um, we are uh, uh, growing major crops in uh, horticulture uh, in New Jersey. We grow s sod, is a, is, a, is a big production area. Uh, I mean, there's, it's, it's endless in terms of the varieties of crops we grow in the state, about 100 varieties of crops. Are we still the garden state? We're absolutely the garden state. Um, it's sometimes, uh, as I said, it changes, uh, but we have 700,000 acres of farmland in the state, some of the most productive in the, in the, in the country. Uh, and there's sectors that are growing and there's sectors that are struggling. And it's always going to be that way because of the nature of agriculture. How many of our 21 counties have farming? About 18 have really serious farming operations. Uh, you know, we have big uh, dairy operation, let's say, in Salem County, grain operation, also in the north. But then there's other areas like Atlanta County, where they're big in blueberries, Burlington County, where they're big in so many crops. So each county has its own particular area that it grows a, a large amount of crop. New Jerseyans love their farmland, I think, don't you? They absolutely do. And an interesting fact, <clears throat> excuse me, is that New Jersey has, has so appreciates their farmland that we've spent almost $1.7 billion in, to preserve farmland, it's just, which happens to be the most in dollars in the entire country. Really? Mm -hmm. I, I remember back in the 80s, there was a building boom. We were tearing up farmland. Uh, they used to say that we would lose a thousand acres of farmland a day. I don't know. That seemed wildly excessive to me at the time. But that's, th there's no urgency today like there was back then about saving farmland, is there? Yes, there is. Uh, we have about 230,000 acres or so preserved now. We'd like to preserve about 500,000 acres uh, to, to make sure that we have that agricultural base in the state. So, um, but you don't you don't hear the uh, state plan advocates uh, crying out for uh, save our cornfields, or, well, we or do you? Well, we have a robust program, and everybody knows it. So each county participates. For instance, the county that I live in, Gloucester County, uh, uh, they're under great pressure to, uh, of losing farmland, and so they are on the fast track to preserve as much as they can. We're sitting uh, in front of your desk in your yeah. office in Trenton. Uh, what issues come to your desk? What, what do you do here? Ah. So we have several divisions. So one of them is food and nutrition, where we're responsible for all the school feeding uh, in the state. So that's about 500 and 600,000 kids a day that we administer those programs. So that's one division. We're trying to do farm to school. Uh, we're bringing in, we're working on school gardens. We have a whole a concentration of things that we're doing within the schools and we monitor all that so you know we have four other divisions one is plant where we're looking for disease pressures from insects so right now it's the spotter and lanternfly is uh, is on our borders and we're trying to make sure that we keep it out um, animal health is another part where we're doing testing uh, to make sure that our livestock in the state uh, and and do testing for actually many other uh, areas besides livestock but how many people work in the Department of Agriculture? In the department, there's about 225. What's the biggest challenge facing farmers today? Well, labor is uh, top, top of the list. Uh, they're always, the you know, pressure is trying to find labor to make sure that they are there to do the work that's, you know, they need to do on the farm. That's one, that's an ever-growing uh, pressure and pretty much not just New Jersey, but across the country uh, where fields just go plowed under because they can't find anyone to because of the current system that's you know so messed up. Uh, another is uh, 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 animals, pressures from deer. Deer are just chewing up the landscape. I know and, they uh, chew up my flowers. I didn't realize they menace the farmers. So just imagine if you were a farmer and you see a stand of deer just walking in and just having lunch. Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a really uh, ever-present problem across the state. We used to have migrant farm workers in South Jersey. Do we still? There are migratory workers for sure. Yeah, they come through, uh, they'll pick a particular crop and then they'll move through 
to another state for an, uh, another opportunity at another another crop or the same crop as the as the as they come to maturity and move north. Do we have an issue around illegal immigrants uh, or undocumented immigrants working the farms? Well, the whole country has that. So there's nothing. Whatever's happening in New Jersey is happening across the country. What are you most excited about now? So what I'm excited about is that we have many opportunities in the state, and we're you know making those connections and developing that. There's agritourism is a big and growing factor uh, in our state, where people come on farms, enjoy uh, the experience there. They might go apple picking or or uh, on, a, on a hayride. Uh, they're coming from the cities. They're coming on in many different ways. Wineries are an expanding uh, 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 opportunity in this state, and um, uh, we have 50 right now, and it continues to grow. Uh, Value-added crops. New Jersey's, you know, one of the most diverse states in the country. And, uh, and so we're growing a lot of those diverse crops uh, that... Uh, What's a value-added crop? So a value-added crop is when you, you are taking, uh, perhaps making a, a sauce or something out of tomatoes, making a salsa. We have somebody making peach cider. Uh, you know, you just, you, you, you take that crop and you add the value and it becomes a processed product. I passed a great farm stand in Colts Neck the other night. You're making me want to go back there. Mr. Secretary, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you. New Jersey also reaps billions of dollars from specialty crops that yield a bumper crop in tourists. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan takes a tour from what's caught on the line to what grows on the vine. These tourists took a boat ride from Point Pleasant Beach to cast a line and harvest a crop that swims just off the Jersey Shore. Swing it right in, Nicky. Swing it right in, Nick. There you go. Delicious to eat, like eating tuna. Yep, we're taking you on a different kind of harvest tourism trip because most folks already know about you-pick farms and corn mazes and cut-your-own Christmas trees, right? So we'll join about 60 folks on the 85-foot Queen Mary, one of about 100 party boats that work out of about a dozen ports along the Jersey coastline. Adults pay 69 bucks for a six-hour trip. It's about enjoyment, it's about the sport, but ultimately I'd like to come home and you know, cook fresh fish to eat. There's nothing like it. Good, clean fun. I grew up fishing with my father. I've been doing it since I was 12 years old, and I just love it. Uh, deep sea fishing and enjoy catching the fish. Kids pay 39 bucks, and a lot of kids came out to fish with their families. Grandfathers advise their grandsons. You know how to do it now, right? I love fishing. I love to eat fish. I love every bit about fishing. Ten-year-old Nikki Horvat wants to work on the Queen Mary for Captain Dave Ribbick. It's where Ribbick got his start. I started on the Queen Mary when I was 16 years old in high school and uh, worked through college as a deckhand. And then after college, I got my captain's license. I ran the boat full-time at night. Ribbick eventually bought the boat, which runs fishing or whale watching trips seven days a week. Following Captain Dave's lead as he scoped out schools of fish, other party boats worked next to the Queen Mary, the Jamaica, the Golden Eagle, and the Belmar Princess. But far fewer than back in the industry's heyday, recreational fishing currently supports 20,000 jobs and pumps $1.3 billion every year into New Jersey's economy. It's really an important part of the tourism industry in New Jersey. We bring people from Pennsylvania, Ohio. They come down to fish for scub, black sea bass, summer flounder. Mates on the Queen Mary help bring in the fish, supply rods and reels, bait hooks, and cast out and untangle lines. Anglers pulled in bluefish, fluke, mackerel, bonito, even a cow nose ray. I caught a couple of sea robins. They look like flying fish and a black sea bass that was way too small to keep. I'm sorry, dude. I'm so, so, so sorry. Goodbye. In fact, the size and number of fish caught has steadily declined, along with the number of fishing trips made by charter and party boats from 633,000 trips in 2006 to 466,000 in 2015, a 26% drop. Some longtime fisher folk claim stocks are simply depleted and conservation quotas are restrictive. A few years ago, I caught 22 fluke in one day, but I had to throw every one of them back because they were all undersized. When I was a kid, you could get by, you could catch a 14 and a half inch fluke. 
Now it's up to, I think, 18, 18 and a half, 19 inches. So fish that you could normally keep, you can't keep anymore. Plus we need to do realistic regulations. People go out to fish, if they're paying $80 for a ticket on a party boat or $65, they need to come home with some reward for their efforts and for the money they spent. A controversial bill pending in the U.S. Senate would abolish quotas for some species. Meanwhile, this trip produced one big fluke, a definite keeper, and most people caught several blues. Is this something you would come back and do again? Yeah, absolutely. I usually do fresh water and lakes, but this is definitely something I would do again. It's pretty neat. So one of the mates gave me some advice about how to take a picture with your fish. You stand like this, because it looks really big this way, when really, maybe it's not so big. What is big and growing is New Jersey's winery tourism industry, another agritourism business that's off the beaten path. Vineyards like Unionville, located in the rolling Sourland Mountains of Hunterdon County, showcase a vintage venue. The 1858 estate with an updated tasting room and several wines made from locally grown grapes that offer visitors an opportunity to sip and savor and buy by the bottle. It's beautiful. It's like a different state. It's just full of greenery and so many plants and beautiful farms and a lot of Jersey that doesn't get, you know, the good press. So it's almost like a hidden gem, which is nice. And what about the wine? Well, the wine's the best part, so <laughs> it's it delicious. To be a New Jersey winery and get 89 point scores from the Wine Advocate, it's, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, you can't lie. It's, it's a good feeling, and, and hopefully we're only climbing from there. Connor Quilty's a winemaker. When these Chardonnay grapes fully ripen in the East Amwell sun, high on a hill above Unionville's barn, Connor will work with the intensely flavored juice and let it age in oaken barrels. The vineyard now boasts almost 40 acres planted with 17 different vinifera grapes. So where's the buzz about Jersey wine? All you hear is Napa and Sonoma. We're kind of in that like 1950s California state where the world doesn't really know about it. And eventually at some point, you know, if we work hard enough, I sincerely believe we can get there. Jason Diaz works in Unionville's newest vineyard at Coventry Farms, training one-year-old vines to grab the wires. It's a good metaphor for the Garden State's wine tourism industry, which saw the number of Jersey wineries boom from 38 to 50 since 2011. Most of them bottle just about 5,000 cases or less per year, but a recent study showed production swelled by almost 300,000 gallons from 2006 to 2011. Close to 109,000 wine-loving tourists visited a couple years ago. I actually encourage uh, the wineries I work with to, fl to fly the Jersey flag. Uh, I, I think that there are enough people in this state that are proud of New Jersey and proud of where they come from that when they learn that there is great wine being made here, they're not afraid of the word New Jersey on the bottle. But finding Jersey vineyards can be problematic. They can't post signs on the interstates. And this couple from Wayne had to Google to locate Unionville. I read online, it said romantic day trip. So I said, oh, let's try that one. A little romance, a little wine. Yeah. yeah. But during a recent visit to the Amalthea Cellars Winery in Atco, Governor Murphy announced a brand new program to promote Jersey wines. It features a toolkit on the state's Find Jersey Fresh website that now helps tourists map a winery trip. Meanwhile, Betsy Alger poured the couple an ounce of each variety. There's a $10 tasting fee per person. She told them how to look for color and how to swirl the wine and inhale its aroma. Some people come in and they're a little bit shy about tasting wine. Maybe they haven't, they're new to wine, they haven't been to a tasting room before. Um, they're afraid that they're gonna be talked down to. And oh. we, we go out of our way to eliminate that pompous buffoonery that can surround wine. Striving to boost tourism, wineries want the state to loosen regulations and pump up promotion. Five wineries started their own co-op in 2015. The idea is to have our own marketing campaigns, hold tasting events where you're specifically tasting wines grown from New Jersey grapes. New Jersey's total tourism revenue in 2017 topped $45 billion last year, yet only about 20 million of that flowed from tourism at New Jersey wineries. But they're diversifying. Now many host events like weddings. Leslie Heyman got married at Unionville five years ago. 
we just thought it was so beautiful and peaceful and the perfect place. So we wanted to come back and share it with our boys and pick up some wine and enjoy the day. Given the bounty of this year's harvest, it may be hard to believe hunger is still pervasive here. The Center for Food Action calculates nearly one in ten New Jersey residents don't have an adequate, consistent supply of food. Many of them live in communities that don't have a single grocery store. Brianna Venosi reports on what's being done for families who live in food deserts. As we drive the roads of rural South Jersey, the farmlands seem endless, passing every you pick it nursery you can name. But make no mistake, what we're about to enter is actually the desert. About three years ago, we targeted about 21 food deserts in our area. And these are places where about 30% of the population is at least a mile away from a grocery store or a place where they can buy food. Food deserts, nutritional wastelands, often but not always in low-income areas, where shoppers depend on fast food chains or the cheap but heavily processed items from the corner store. And the number of these so-called deserts, especially in the southern half of the state, it's significant. That's where we find Charles Washington, mayor of Salem City, Salem County. Population, 5,000. Number of supermarkets, zero. Most of our residents uh, don't have access to transportation, um, so they are limited as it relates to where they can go to shop. Our closest grocery store is about 12 to 15 miles away. Um, the previous operator uh, that uh, just recently vacated the city, was in the city for over 30 years. In Salem, longtime operator Incalingo's Market closed its doors about a year ago. The USDA says roughly 298,000 New Jersey residents have limited access to a supermarket or grocery store within what are considered the state's 134 food deserts. 21 of those are in Gloucester, Salem, and Cumberland counties combined, which may not sound overly disproportionate until you look at the sparse population and lack of transportation options. It's always about uh, the, the bottom line. Um, no one wants to come into a community where they're not going to be patronized, um, where the incentives uh, aren't heavy and that they're going to get a return on their investment. And we understand that. Um, and we are uh, working to uh, meet the investors in, in their place of need as well. You come to the dollar store sometimes to do some grocery shopping? Yes. Because, I mean, are there enough options? Like, what, what's no, the situation? No, the Dollar Tree, um, Dollar General down there. We have a family dollar. That's it. As far as the little frozen meats, that's what we get from here. But they run out so quickly because we don't have no grocery store anymore. It's a bit ironic, really. Right now, we're in an area saturated with farms, some of the region's largest producers of our fresh foods. Yet a scene like this, a vacant, deserted supermarket, well, that's all too common. We're trying to figure out how can we go into those areas and bring partnerships that will create more food access to people who are there. Salem's just one of many communities partnering with nonprofits like the Food Bank of South Jersey, distributing healthy foods at no cost so residents with little means can put a meal on the table. So about 12 million pounds 12 were million pounds last year. Last year yes. About a, a million pounds a month. About a million pounds a month, That's yeah. That's a lot of food. All out of this warehouse. But it's still not enough. A report from a group called Feeding America found 10% or nearly a million new Jerseyans in 2016 were food insecure, meaning for a number of reasons they were unable to get enough healthy food for themselves and their families. If you can get to where some of our distributions are, we have a Hope Mobile which began as a tractor trailer that goes out to communities and we bring the food to that community. So we will set up uh, in a parking lot or in a church environment and we'll distribute the food. So if you can't come to us, we will come to you. Food deserts alone aren't to blame for eating habits and insecurity. There's the issue of inequality, differences in income, education, and in turn, nutritional knowledge. There's one thing to have access to a supermarket, to the produce, but it's another to know what to do with it. Exactly, and especially if there's produce you see that's not familiar to you that you haven't seen. We teach everything from label reading to how to cut up a whole chicken. 
Inside the food bank's kitchen, we find Trisha Yo prepping for her health and wellness cooking class. She teaches everyone, ages 4 to 98, the ins and outs of healthy eating. A lot of times when people are visiting the pantries, they're receiving items that may not be by choice and they don't know what to do with it. So in that case, we are showing them how to new, use a new product for the first time or how to take things that they're already cooking and make them in a healthier way. Here's the best part. They come for a six week course and leave each class with a recipe and bag of groceries. We are making stir fry veggies with rice. At the Gonzalez home in Chislehurst, Camden County, that makes mealtime a family activity. All right. And a source of food access without going to a pantry. A lot of it in the store is really expensive. Yeah. So that's a big, a big issue. Yeah. One, well, when you've got three growing kids, that's a lot that you have to buy. Yeah. Here's the thing: the kids are totally into it. My man, I like the hat. <laughs> we were looking at like labels and stuff, but. Adam taught us a lot more about really paying attention to the labels and finding out stuff that we thought was healthy actually wasn't healthy. Cruising down the produce aisle, it's no wonder some of these fruits and veggies can seem intimidating. I mean, how the heck do you cook a beet? It turns out some larger chains like ShopRite provide free nutrition consultations and store tours. I will even get people who come in right after they've been discharged from the hospital because their doctors have sent them to see a dietitian. So, and really the best place to educate people on what they should be eating is in the grocery store where they are purchasing their food. So if we're looking at different fruits, you don't have to worry so much about the sugar content in fruits, it's more so the serving size. The dietitians on staff are starting to spread to more urban locations, helping with meal planning on a budget. So one of the obstacles we often hear about to people getting fresh produce is just the cost and also the accessibility. Are there other options? Yeah, frozen fruits and vegetables are a really great option. They're usually picked at peak ripeness and then frozen, so you're retaining all the nutrient value in them. And they're usually a lot more affordable. Back in Salem, though, they're still a long way from an option like this. We reached out to all the major chains. Uh, we knew that was a, a heavy lift and uphill battle. Um, we are a population just under 5,000, and uh, the grocery store, the current site that we have, uh, it, it is a small space, about 20,000 uh, square feet. Um, so those numbers oftentimes don't meet the metrics for the larger chain, so we're at a disadvantage. Here's the thing, breaking the food desert cycle also means finding an operator willing to be a vested partner in a low-income neighborhood. If they were really in it for the community, then we would have a grocery store right now. Because location, well, that's just part of this food desert equation. There are alternative farmers who are finding locations where they can grow fresh produce without setting foot on traditional farmland. Joanna Gagas looks at a segment of agriculture where things are looking up. When our founders coined the term the Garden State, they likely didn't envision trays of plants and artificial light, but these have become the symbols of an alternative farming movement that's on the rise in New Jersey. Organic, sustainable farming that connects fresh produce with the communities it feeds. A pioneer in this movement is Aero Farms, the world's largest vertical farm located right in Newark. Aero Farms is using a system called aeroponics, where instead of sun and soil, crops are grown with LED lighting and nutrient-enriched water. Aero Farms plans to open its 10th and largest space in Camden later this year. I think that New Jersey is definitely doing a lot in terms of our vertical farming. I mean, they have a huge one up in Newark, which is Aero Farm, which is really paving the way for, you know, these urban farms. One of those new farms is Indigro, founded by Patrick Igliotti and Lou Monti, right in their Cherry Hill home. I said, I wonder if we can grow microgreens in our house. Like, I wonder if that's something that's possible. So we did a little bit more research and, you know, we've realized that it probably was possible. Patrick says microgreens are huge in the culinary scene today. 
The first reason is they look pretty. All the different colors, you know, the pinks, the purples, the yellows, all that different stuff. And the second reason is they do have really intense flavor profiles. So a lot of them, you know, like arugula for instance, the flavor, the pepperiness that you're going to get from that is going to be like five to ten times the intensity that you're going to get from regular arugula. So that those types of flavors, that's what the chefs are, you know, really you know, looking for. Microgreens mature very quickly. This crop will be fully grown in just about two weeks. The average lettuce takes a minimum of 45 days, some 60, some even longer to mature. Faster turnaround means more product to sell. I like to say seed to feed anywhere from 10 to 14 days for most things. And from the time you cut it to the time it's actually served on a plate, what is that time usually? Usually less. I mean, we deliver in less than a day. So we usually harvest same day or if not, like the night before. Gigliotti and Monty wanted a sustainable model because they're concerned about the future of the farming industry. There's only so much farmland the viability of that, of that soil. I mean, four, five, six generations from now, who knows if that soil is even going to have any nutrients left? Who knows if you're going to be able to add nutrients to it? This is what I think the future is going to be. This is the big aha moment. A lack of space didn't stop one farmer from setting up crop. He's partnered with local homeowners, essentially leasing their backyards, planting a variety of crops, and creating a micro farm. I thought it was a great uh, business model to adopt uh, because uh, in New Jersey, uh, property is expensive. And so I said, well, I can't just, uh, I'm not in a position to buy farmland right now, so I, I'll, I'll just go ahead and approach my neighbors and see if they're open to it. Daniel Cortez has expanded microherb into four yards across several towns in Gloucester County, just south of Camden. He provides the homeowners with $20 worth of produce from each harvest. And to make the most of his small space, Cortez grows crops that mature in 50 days or less. I don't have the time or space to grow corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes. So what I do grow is lettuce, uh, radishes, beets. In the summer I do summer squash, uh, tomatoes. It's all quick growing, arugula, spinach, uh, lettuce, mainly a lot of greens. What I'm bringing is a, a new model that is still hasn't uh, caught on yet because people are looking at uh, that when they think of farm, they think of a conventional farm out in the rural area. So this is more of bringing the farm into the community uh, so people can start to reconnect with where their food comes from and how it's grown. Tony Gibbons has revitalized this dilapidated greenhouse in Newark's Branch Brook Park into a thriving company called Radical Farm. It had fallen into really disrepair and sort of decay to some uh, extent. So about four years ago, we set up, we came in, cleaned it out, and set up some hydroponic systems with the aim of really turning into a productive space again for the, the county. Gibbons uses a system of hydroponic farming called nutrient film technique to grow an assortment of baby greens like bok choy, kale, and chard. We're really, we're just managing the growth for about depending on the plant, about three to five weeks. So I see the water running through this pipe, right? And it's streaming down? Exactly. So uh, there are reservoirs underneath each of the tables, and then there's pumps that are just pumping it directly through these cables into the channels. Um, it's just gravity that's taking it down, and it's heading right back into the reservoir. This recirculating water system uses only 10% of the water required in more traditional farming methods, and it reduces dangerous runoff into streams and rivers. It can be harmful for plant life both in the streams and also um, in, on the surrounding areas. So we are able to eliminate that, uh, that risk by growing indoors and growing hydroponically. To avoid pesticides, Gibbons uses a system called integrated pest management, which includes things like beneficial insects, uh, crop rotations, making sure that we're planting the proper uh, seeds for the time, proper time of year so we're not forcing it to sort of do things out of seasonality. Feeding the community is the mission of City Green, a farm with locations in Clifton and Patterson. Just off this busy highway in northern New Jersey is an expansive stretch of five acres that's combining organic farming with a civic mission. One of the biggest missions is food access, providing food access to low-income communities. Um, people that don't have access to fresh, healthy vegetables. So all of this food grown here is going towards our markets that is providing that food for them. You won't find fertilization, pesticides, or carefully prepared soil on this farm. City Green is using an approach called permaculture, 
where crops grow in a naturally occurring ecosystem, complete with all the weeds, pests, and fungi who call this land home. This is our permaculture food forest, we call it. Um, so essentially, we're trying to develop a forest-like ecosystem here, which means we're introducing perennial crops that are beneficial for us, um, such as berries, nuts, and fruit. Um, and we want them to exist in almost like a wild setting where they're kind of taking care of each other. City Green also rotates its crops every year so nutrients aren't depleted from the soil, an approach Anderson would like to see catch on. Traditional farmers are going to need to start applying sustainable methods um, because our climate is changing so rapidly. It's not secure to be, you know, depleting the soil anymore with pesticides or, or even synthetic fertilizers. The more we can let nature work on our side and let the plants be healthy in a natural way, uh, the more healthy they will be in the future. City Green is running a youth education program where kids from Patterson and the area visit, many seeing a farm for the first time. Where they're coming from and going to was Leah Mishkin's assignment. We last left her produce on a loading dock. Leah Mishkin picks up her peck of peppers mid-process. Our peppers have been planted, grown, and picked. Now it's time for them to head from Cassidy Farm to Dandrea Produce for distribution. The thing is, it's very difficult to take time planning with retailers, uh, laying out seasonal programs and pricing and knowing market trends. It's very hard for farmers to do that, so that's where we come in. The first step is the inspection process. He'll count the peppers, he'll look at the surface, if there's any imperfections, he'll let us know, and um, he'll then determine by percentages what the defects are. So then we can put together thorough QC reports with pictures, um, and that way we can kind of give our growers an idea of what everything's looking like. We know if we're hitting our customer specs at the retail level, and we can control quality that way. The peppers then go into the cooler, then eventually back onto the truck to take them to the supermarket. Like many of the businesses out here, this place has been in the family since 1917. Peter D'Andrea is fourth generation. Oh, it was a small farm, uh, just around 200 acres right down the street. It's probably about 10, 15 minutes from here um, in Vineland, and it was, in, it was my great grandfather. And, uh, you know, so it was just a small operation. We only did a couple items. D'Andrea says farming requires generations of knowledge, and it's pretty expensive from the machinery to the land. If you look at the average age of the farmer in America now, it's over 50 years old. And so a guy who's in his 60s now, whose children don't want to get into the family business, for him to be able to sell his farm, uh, you know, it's not necessarily uh, that bad of a, of a prospect. How do you keep it going? How do we keep the you know, farm to table concept going? Sure, from our perspective, it's making the job of farming as easy as possible in terms of what we're able to do to help in the financing and the operational aspects. A lot of these families do want to stay in it. And for us, the importance is paramount to try to help support the sustainable efforts to keep local farms operating um, the way they have been for decades. To his farming, you have to adapt. And you can't ever stand still. You can't say, oh, I'm happy with peppers, or I'm happy with one drip line, I had to go to two. The good news is eating healthy is a growing trend which is helping the industry. I mean, it's definitely going to take, uh, you know, certainly an effort from the whole community here. With farmers like George, inspectors like Bob, and a desire to help with logistics like Peter. So this pepper can get to the supermarket, onto the shelf, from the farm to your table. Leah Mishkin's farm to table peppers have one last pit stop in a pot. Leah's cooking up a feast with chef Kathy Gold. All right, this is really exciting because we just saw how the pepper got from farm to table and now we're with Chef Kathy Gold. Hello. Hi. So and nice I'm excited because we're going to learn a dish on what to do with this pepper once it hits your table. What is this dish called? This is piperade, and so this is a classic dish from the Basque region of France, but we're just having all of this gorgeous produce, late harvest produce from New Jersey, which has the best produce ever, and we're going to make this dish right here at In the Kitchen Cooking School. So, I have to ask, are you going to use the red or the green? We're going to use both. And so everybody knows that all peppers start out green, right? You probably learned that. This was the twist in my story. <laughs> I had no idea that and this genetically, they become whatever they're 
they're predestined to be. So all these gorgeous colors, they even come in purple and chocolate and white and striped colors that are just exquisite. And the flavor is just indescribably sweet and beautiful. All right, let's get started. And so did you want to go ahead and cut that pepper? Yes, or yes, to... I would love to. And while you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and put our tomatoes in to cook and they're going to burst and get all juicy and fantastic. Okay. And so you can cut it that way and then I'll show you the way I do it. Okay. And I'm going to switch with you to move this way and turn our heat on. Okay. Right under our Chef pan. Gold, does this look cooking school appropriate? It's a way. <laughs> uh, we do it a different way because... Isn't this a good idea though? It's a great idea and that is the best way to do it if you're going to stuff your pepper with something oh. fantastic. Do you like to do strips? I or? do. I do a julienne which is, are the thin strips and then you can cut it into a dice as you're doing which is which is fine. Depends on the size that you want in the dish that you're making. So our oil is heating nicely Okay. and that's looking good. We can throw in some of our Gorgeous heirloom tomatoes. The colors are beautiful. I know, I love these. And so that's going to come in. And I'm just going to give these a little bit of a chop because they're a little bit bigger. And this is one of our heirloom tomatoes. This beautiful red stripe has a lot of acid in it, which I really love. Some people like it very mild, not me. Where do you go to buy your tomatoes? So I like to support our local economy and our local farm. So I do a combination. I have a CSA, which is Community Supported Agriculture. And I have that on Wednesday either a delivery or a pickup, and then our farmer's markets on Saturday morning. So it really works well. By the time Saturday rolls around, I'm ready to restock with all the things that I need to use. Here, so, I'll let you keep cutting. You sure. show us how it's done. So we're looking at some nice blistering here, which is great. I'm just going to go ahead and cut this into quarters. Get that in. And this one as well. Okay. I like to have a nice flat. This is very hot. Yeah, slow medium heat. We want a nice little sizzle, right? Okay. We want our tomatoes to start to collapse and caramelize a little bit, which means just get brown and all the natural sugars start to develop. So that looks pretty good. But I'll show you how I like to cut a pepper. This is how it's really done. <laughs> See all these little seeds all over the place? Yeah. I like to try to avoid that. So I'm going to actually fillet the pepper right off that whole seed pod, which we know is attached to that stem. So I, at an angle, I'm going to take my knife and follow the contour all the way down. And now I can see where all of the seeds are. And right between the cell and the membrane, we can go ahead and cut that right off just like that. And then we can come back and clean up whatever we need to clean up. So we're going to leave these to the side and okay. cut our onion. And so tip of the onion, cut that right off, creating a nice flat surface for ourselves. This is called a tunnel cut so that my knife doesn't slip and hurt my fingers. It's right in for a little... And then eventually we'll add the peppers, we'll add the onion. I mean, you know, at this point you can go ahead and add those peppers. I never thought I learned so much about the pepper. It was actually really interesting. And you appreciate it more knowing how long it takes to get from one step to your table. So we talk about green peppers and colored peppers and why the peppers, when they're ripe, have, are more expensive in the marketplace. Right. And it's all about that they need to stay on the vines a little bit longer and have a shorter shelf life. Exactly. And if you want to, you can stir that for us. Sure. One more step, adding some garlic. Okay. Smells so good. Give a little whack. Peels easily. Uh -huh. And this is an easy recipe anyone can do at home. It's Yes, and you just need the right ingredients. Everything, see that nice caramelization, that's fantastic. We're going to go ahead and season a little salt and pepper. And our pepper, always grind one way, otherwise you strip your gears. And a little, oh, that does really smell great. And a little tiny bit of a chili pepper, ground chili pepper that actually grows in France called piment d'esplet. It's not super spicy, but gives a really nice depth of heat. And Great. we are ready to go. All, All right, I'll let you do the honor of plating it. And so, <laughs> right into your Just a bowl. nice, healthy, good ingredient kind of a dish. And it's really nice to serve this with both those peppers, with a little bit of toast points, which if you want to hand that to me. Sure. Nice grilled bread. I'm getting ready. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. This looks amazing. Mmm. 
Well, it's incredible. Just Very burst good. with flavor, yeah. so fresh. Really? And really not a lot that we did. Wow, you could really taste, it's really fresh, it's great. So, this is one dish, but we are going to be making a corn salsa coming up, and you have to tune into this. You don't want to miss it. You just have to go to youtube.com slash NJTV online. That's youtube.com slash NJTV online. Join me, Chef Gold, we'll be there. And uh, that's the end of this segment though. See you soon. Welch's was founded in, in Vineland as well? Correct. We have a lot of rich history in the city of Vineland, um, and Welch's was one of them. Uh, General Mills had Progresso Foods here, which was founded at one point. They have relocated uh, in the last couple of years, uh, which created a little bit of a hole in the city, but our team got very aggressive. We backfilled their plant within 10 months of their exodus, uh, which is phenomenal because we've got a great reputation. Um, we have great resources here. Big agriculture town. Yes, sir. Yep. How many farms? Uh, in excess of 200 commercial farms in the city of Vineland. More than 200 commercial farms in Vineland? That is correct. How big is Vineland? Vineland is uh, a little over 69 square miles uh, in its entirety, and you know, that's a lot to comprehend, but we're larger than a lot of townships and boroughs and uh, different regions in the area. Um, of course, not by population, but definitely by square miles. We are the largest town in the state. What challenges uh, does the size then represent in terms of governing the town? So it's interesting because our resources get spread out so far right. because logistically we are so large. So you need a larger than average police force, you need a larger than average fire force, people to cover that, EMS, um, and of course road crews and departments. You know, because we're dealing, there's over 300 miles of roadway in, the Vine, in Vineland. Uh, a small portion belongs to the state, a small portion belongs to the county, but over 260 miles belong to the city directly. So infrastructure is always a challenge, especially owning your own utilities. So we want to make sure we maintain the integrity of the utility, the quality of the service we deliver, the lower rates that we're able to provide. I know you're in the South. A lot of people know that. And I know sometimes the towns and counties and so forth in the South kind of feel that, okay, the rest of the state really isn't paying attention to us. Do you kind of feel that way sometimes? Yeah, on occasion we do. But I think a lot of it is, is, is our fault, too. Um, we've changed that since I've taken office. We've marketed more aggressively. We've expanded our relationships. Um, we've had a tremendous amount of respect paid to us from Trenton and the governor's office. Uh, the governor's office has been very kind to the city of Ireland. Uh, the Senate has been very kind in the assembly here now. We have a lot of different representation, and a lot of that is part and parcel to the relationships that we have been able to form. Uh, myself being out networking amongst um, our folks in the state and just trying to push the positive message here. There's so much positive that we're so thankful for and we're blessed to have in our region and we want to spread that love and that message all throughout the state. When you think of the marketing campaign that you have done and getting the word out about Vineland, I understand Vineland was just in a national publication as well. Correct. We've been several times uh, in the last couple of years we've had some national publicity which is phenomenal because for years we had nothing. Um, and now we're getting recognized because we are pushing it out and showing people what, our, what quality we have here, what our attributes are, and what we can bring to the table. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we're so unique in having all of our own municipal utilities that we're very competitive against the big markets. Um, so companies that want to relocate here in many cases can find themselves, you know, in maybe 8, 10, 12, 15 percent below in electric rates depending on what, what their consumption is compared to that, and that's huge for some of these carriers, especially in the cold storage market, food processing market, high users. So we have our own generation station here where Violent can become self-sufficient as well. You mentioned the population is not that big for 69 square miles, but I would imagine though with the kind of, uh, uh, as attractive as it is to businesses and businesses uh, proving that by moving to town, yes. you don't have a large out-migration. No, we do not, um, which is tremendous because we're o over 60,000 people in the city of Island and growing. You know, we're not exponentially growing quickly, which is okay, because you don't want that crazy growth. Right. You want to have that steady growth, that nice pace, because then you can plan. And that's the big thing. You know, currently we're in a master plan review in the city of Island, so we're going over a lot of our current zoning and what we're looking for. And it's, it's nice to see that with the commercial development along with the residential development. We have a very healthy balance, and we want to maintain that. What about taxes? You've got a big town. You've yes. got businesses moving in, and, and that's attractive. Yes. What are they telling you about taxes? What do citizens there say about taxes? So it's interesting you say that. So our tax rate in the city of Ireland is broken up into several components. One, you have the municipal tax rate, which I, which I will say out of our big three cities in the county is the lowest. Um, we have a county tax rate, we have a school tax rate, and then we have a library tax rate. Then you have like your open space tax. So really just five categories. Um, our municipal tax rate being as low as it is is very competitive um, against other cities. 
Um, our county tax rate is, is a little bit high right now, but they're working on being competitive in the county with getting some more advantage. But we have a great partnership with our county and even with our county improvement authority to help us drive business into the city of Island. So when they're here, we're offered our offer pilot programs and incentives as well. And, you know, pilot being payment in lieu of taxes. So when somebody wants to come in and we want that job growth to bring down that unemployment rate and we want to bring that success into the city, we have the tools and we have the business friendly environment to make that happen. Mr. Mayor, we're sitting here at Batuzzi's Market, yes. and, and one of the things I have to ask you is that as we see all this fresh produce and so forth, what does Vineland, in an agriculture sense, what does it mean for the rest of the state to have uh, more than 200 farms? You feed the state. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's the Garden State, and, you know, and that stays with us here. We're very happy. I mean, our agricultural component is tremendous. I know for myself and my children and my family, it's so nice that on, and on this time of year, at any given day, that we're preparing dinner at home. I can literally drive a couple blocks down the street in my, in my area and go to any number of produce stands to go pick up something quick. You know, I have to hear, hey, uh, we need some cucumbers tonight or get some tomatoes or I need a head of romaine or we want something else. And, oh, all right, let's, like, we'll go get some broccoli rob today. And it's easy. It's quick. A lot of areas take that for granted, and I know we certainly do. Um, and our farmers are wonderful here. I mean, they are an integral part of this community. They really are a huge driving force to uh, our success in this community because to keep everybody nourished. Mayor Andy Peducci, thank you very much, sir. My pleasure. My pleasure, sir. Thank it was you. a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you to all the people here at Bertuzzi's, the Mayor and Agriculture Secretary, and all of you who've joined us from home or online. We'll see you next time when we're in your neighborhood. Major funding for In Your Neighborhood Vineland has been provided by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, working with others to build a national culture of health, enabling everyone in America to live longer, healthier lives. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities.